Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure seeing so many of you out here today. Oh, let me start off Gil, sir. Everybody was ready but Gil. Can't stop Gil. I don't know if you recognize the tune. That was Gil Scott Heron's message to the messengers. And I think it's most apropos for this discussion that we're going to have tonight. Because what we're looking at is what would people from before say about what it is that we're doing now. This is a collaborative effort between Roots 101, founded, of course, by Mr. Lamont Collins. We have a few words from him in just a minute. And the Christina Lou Brown, Lee Brown rather, Environment Institute at the University of Louisville. Where one of the taglines there is where we explore, learn, and understand how our natural, social, and personal environments impact upon human health and chronic disease. This, of course, was founded by Christine Lee Brown, noted uh, philanthropist, and under the direction of Dr. Aruni Bhatnagar and Dr. Ted Smith. I think you might be asking a question. Why the hell is Christine Lee Brown Environment Institute partnering with Roots 101 here at this facility. I want you to rest assured, this is not going to be a wastewater treatment evaluation, so no one has to give a small stool sample, and it's not going to be run. So keep your pants on and just relax and stay seated where you are. <laughs> However, I am a colon and rectal surgeon, so if you bend over, I just may do an examination on you. <clears throat> but I think it's important when looking at what the Environ Institute is all about, it's, um, you know, it's, we have to remember from the World Health Organization's definition when we talk about what is health. Health is not merely the absence of disease. And as you carry that further, it is a state of optimal physical, mental, and social well-being, which clearly gets us into the realm of this institution here. That's why we're here. So the question before us tonight is going to be, what would Baldwin, King, and their fellow warriors Think about America of today. Now, the person who's going to lead us through some of this discussion is going to be a person who's a founder and scholar in residence at the, um, of the Baldwin King Project at the Environment Institute. He's the director. For one reason or another, I am the co-director. So when I think about this, <laughs> we all remember Obama and Luther. For those, uh, maybe not. Luther was Obama's anger translator. So Luther was the one who got. Mm -hmm. Well, I want you to think about the roles being a little different. This Luther is the one that calms stuff down. <laughs> we got the high octane Obama, who's <laughs> the director of the program. So if you see me up here, just you know, I'm just calming it down, trying to calm it down. But before we get into the introduction of our speaker, let me just say again, we, we are fortunate to be here at Roots 101. This is one of these gems, you know, let's face it. This is a gem in a sea of turmoil. I often think that this design to me looks like a ship. Lamont tells me I'm crazy, but I still think this looks like a ship. This museum was recognized by Architectural Digest in 2020 as the list of one of the top 20 museums in the world. USA Today listed it as one of the 10 best new attractions in 2021. And in 2021, this museum also was a recipient of a Ford Foundation grant. This was founded by Lamont Collins in 2020 to promote the understanding and inspire appreciation of the achievements and contributions and experiences of African Americans. To welcome us here today, I give you Mr. Lamont Collins. My name is Mark Collins, founder and CEO of Roots 101 African American Museum. Well, you guys have been here before, I'd like to do something that you should know what to do. Because it's something we do when you come in our house. I say Roots 101 and you say our house. Just like a football game. I would say like a UL basketball game, but a lot of you wasn't there. <laughs> so, you say Roots 101, you say our house. Roots 101! Our house tells the story of the African American journey from Africa to America. When we come to this house, this is why I let kids know they're descendants of kings and queens that were enslaved in America. You know, we were bulldozed for bulldozers, jackhammer for jackhammer, and engineers for engineering degrees. We built this place. So sit back, enjoy what we put together, because I have the 
opportunity to work with Dr. Jones. And wait, there's another Dr. Jones here. Where's it? Where's it Ron Jones? Where's, it? Where's Dr. Jones? The real Dr. The real Dr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> when I attended University of Louisville, played football at University of Louisville, Dr. Jones was Pan African Studies professor. And she changed my life when I went in that classroom in 1980 or 1979. Gregory, 1979. She is a forefather or four sister of African American studies in Louisville, Kentucky. She does not give it up. Stand up. She was growing up in universities, didn't even know how important it was to students like me. Uh, it, it gave us so much to feel free and good about ourselves. So I hang here today off of who you were yesterday and the importance of who you are and the importance of who I am today. Thank you. If all things go well, what we're going to do is have introduction of our speaker. After he speaks, I'm going to be wandering around because I want to ask questions. I know a lot of y'all, important people, smart people, far smarter than I am, don't mean a thing. We're going to ask you the questions too. May, and if you have a question, just raise your hand so I can bring the microphone over there to you so we can make sure everyone gets involved in this dialogue. Please don't get mad at me because when 7 o'clock comes around, the microphone's going to get turned off. I'm getting old <laughs> and, and my bedtime comes up real quick, okay? So I'm going to turn off the microphone. I don't mean anything bad by it. To introduce tonight's speaker, we have a special guest. She is a 10th grader at Collegiate High School, which makes her about 15 years of age. She is very athletic, but more importantly, Mayor Fisher, you better watch out if you ever plan on running again. She's the vice president of her class, so she's obviously interested in politics. Who would not that? I give you Ms. Jordan Jones. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to the first annual Baldwin King Memorial Lecture. My name is Jordan Jones, and today I have the privilege to introduce my father and your keynote speaker this evening, Dr. Ricky Jones. You all know him as the Baldwin King Fellow at Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute, a professor in Pan-African Studies at the University of Louisville, a writer for Leo, the Courier Journal, a proud alum of Morehouse College, and USA Today radio host for the Ricky Jones Show, and a recurring guest on the Terry Miners and Matt Jones shows. You may even know him as the wrestling manager at OVW. <laughs> He is all of that and a lover of black history. You all know him as a fighter for diversity, equity, and inclusion, a leader, and a strong voice in this community. You all get to see the professional side of him, but I know him as an honest father, my video game partner, and one of my biggest supporters. Regardless of which side is in the forefront, I'm always proud to call him my father. He has something meaningful to say and he'll never hold back his true opinions. Without support, guidance, and love, I wouldn't be the person I am today, and that shines into all of the things that he does. I couldn't imagine a better speaker for tonight, and I'm so grateful I have the honor to introduce him. I give you my father, Dr. Ricky Jones. Okay, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make it through the talk now. I think that um, it's really important that we understand why we do the things we do. And for me, ultimately, everything I do is about that little girl there, about Jordan Jones. Because it's so important to me that we work very hard to create a world in which our children can enter into with more dignity, more equality, more humanity, and have opportunities that folks before them did not have. You know, I was talking to her grandfather today, and he constantly reminds me that he loves his granddaughter more than he loves me, <laughs> and, and, and that's fine, but, but her grandfather, my father, was very involved in the civil rights movement in Alabama, 
but he was born in 1934 and saw his father kill his mother when he was five years old. And a couple of years later, he was homeless on the streets of Birmingham. And it led to a very different life for him. And opportunities were, you know, not readily available. But he, he worked hard to build a different life. And he's been successful at that. Uh, he started one of the largest marketing firms in Alabama. But when he started that, that firm, racism was so deep in Alabama that he had a white friend that he put up as the front man because he knew that nobody would give him business if they knew the firm was owned by a black person. And to move from that to me and now to Jordan, you know, that, that means a whole lot to him and me, you know, who ended up growing up in the housing projects of Atlanta. And so I tell people, you know, my good friend, former mayor, Greg Fisher is here. And I tell folks now, I want my child to grow up in a place where she doesn't have to brag about working for the mayor. She can be in a place where she can be the mayor. So, you know, that's the type of world we work to, to, to build. So Jordan, I'm incredibly proud of you. And she didn't want to do this tonight, I got to tell you. I was like, look, um, I need you to do this introduction. And she was like, why? You like speaking in front of people. I don't. You want to play Fortnite or what? <laughs> but, but she still did it because she said, I think it'll make you happy. So you, you made me very, very happy. I'm very, very proud of you. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to recognize some folks before we get started. Certainly, Baba Lamont Collins. And I call him Baba. And a lot of people don't know that African term. It's a, it's a father term, but more. The work that he has put into the city, the work that he's put into Roots 101 is unparalleled. I believe that this is the strongest representation of the African diaspora that we have in this region, bar none. And when you walk in, you get that feeling of power, of strength, of pride that so many people are working to take away from black folk and those who are interested in black folk. And so Baba Lamont Collins has done such a masterful job with almost nothing, okay? Building it up so that you all, we all can share in it. And so we give thanks for him. He's a blessing to this community. He's a blessing to us all. And when I started Baldwin King, I needed a few venues, and there were three that I came up with, and Roots was always gonna be one of them. And I called Baba up, I said, I need to talk to you. And he, <laughs> he said, what, did I do something wrong? <laughs> I said, no, you didn't do anything wrong, you did everything right. And he didn't change me any words. He was like, come down whenever you want. Please give it up for, for Baba Lamar. Also, when we started to do Baldwin King, we looked for partners. And one partner was just automatic. And that partner was automatic because it's been family for me, my professional family, for the 28 years I've been here in uh, the city of Louisville. When I was a graduate student at the University of Kentucky, where I was by myself as a graduate student. I was the only African-American doctoral student in the political science department at that school at the time. No other black doctoral students, no black professors until my last year. But by the time I got to UK, I was fully armed because I went to Morehouse, right? And so I didn't care. But I knew that when I got ready to leave, I would either go back to an HBCU to teach and I said, if I go to, if I teach in a political science department, I'll go to an HBCU. But if I go to a predominantly white institution, I'll teach in a black studies department. Yeah. 
even at 28 years old, I was very, very clear that I wasn't trying to be in an environment where I daily had to deal with racial assault, where my work was not just appre not appreciated, but was attacked, and my views of the world were attacked. And so the University of Louisville's Pan-African Studies Department was the last job I interviewed for. And a lot of people don't know this about me, but I'm, I'm a pretty spiritual man. My grandmother raised me in the church, and sometimes God speaks to you and when I interviewed for the job, I knew when I left, I told my grandmother, who was still alive at the time, who raised me, I said, if they offer me that job, I'm taking it. Because what I felt when I visited here was so incredibly powerful. And it was a little family, right? Basically an HBCU housed within the plantation of the University of Louisville. And it was led by Dr. Yvonne Jones. She is the chair who hired me. A lot of people don't know that. She hired me. Um, I'm an Atlanta kid. She's from New York, still has those big city sensibilities, and you know, served as a, as a professional mother figure to me. And what a lot of people don't know either is, because it ha we haven't done enough this year, but this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Department of Pan-African Studies. We teach black studies in Kentucky. And Yvonne Jones came to this university literally a year after Pan-African Studies was founded. So she has been the stalwart, right? She has been the standard. She's been the constant in that department for 50 years. So please give it up for Dr. Yvonne Jones again. You know, and sometimes people ask, is uh, the other Dr. Jones your mama? And I say, yeah, <laughs> she is. So please pay attention to Pan-African Studies. Pan-African Studies is a great department. Um, it's not funded properly right now. With the new budget model at the university, I think it's at risk, quite frankly. Uh, but everybody thinks I'm paranoid, but we shall see. But talk, call the new president up and ask her what she doing for Pan-African Studies. Maybe you can get in touch with her it's more difficult for me. Um, another partner that was obvious for, for me was the Louisville Urban League, which I believe is one of the strongest chapters of the Urban League in the country right now. It's led by Brother Lyndon Pryor, who is the new president and CEO. Lyndon couldn't be here tonight because he got kids and he went away on spring break. He got money to do that, I guess. Um, <laughs> But the Urban League has been a great partner. So everything that we put out, you're going to have Pan-African Studies there. You got the Urban League there. And of course, you got Roots 101 there. Lastly, um, well, not lastly, actually, a very good friend of mine who's in Atlanta, they do a program called Black Man Lab, where every Monday of the year, they bring these black boys and men together and talk about issues that impact them. Um, those of you who came to our first program at Filson, met Mowley Mel Davis. And so Black Man Lab Atlanta partners with, with us. I don't have the, the, the energy, the bandwidth, or the interest to do nothing every Monday for the entire year. I got to play Fortnite. But Black, Knight, uh, Black Man Lab is a partner with us. And, and lastly, is, is my man here yet, Christine? He's on his way. Um, I would, he, he just walked in. Our last partner was, was kind of a first, and it was an obvious partner was Simmons College of Kentucky. And Simmons is led, my brother's just walking in, by Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby, who got about five doctorates now. He just earned another PhD. But the work he is doing, and, and, and we have a dual relationship. You know, he's my, my pastor, also my line brother, Kim Clay. We, we both attend St. Stephen. And what in the black community, there's an old saying that, you know, in every good teacher is a little bit of preacher. And every good preacher is a little bit of teacher. He's both. He, I believe, is the epitome of Martin Luther King Jr. for this generation in this city. He's not a man who just knows a whole lot about one book. He knows a whole lot about a lot of them. 
we'll talk and he'll say to me, Doc, you read this? And I'm so ashamed that he done read so much more than me. I'll lie to him and say, yeah, I read it, but I, but I have it. But the, the, the fabulous work that Kevin Cosby is doing, not just with St. Stephen, but how he has worked to revive Simmons College of Kentucky that is growing. And I'm an HBCU guy, okay? And so I appreciate what he's doing. And I said today, I truly believe if things stay as they are right now, the way the state is moving and the city is moving, Simmons College of Kentucky really provides the strongest opportunity for black children to get an education that is not going to warp their minds moving forward. I sincerely believe that. It doesn't have to be that way. The University of Louisville doesn't have to be what it is right now, but it has to admit what it is so that it can change. As James Baldwin said, all things that are faced cannot be fixed, but you cannot fix it if you will not face it. So, you know, we, he had a program today, and I'm tired now because he had me over there at the church for three hours today. <laughs> But it's okay. It was such a wonderful thing. And we, and we didn't talk about it, but we didn't, so we didn't know that both of us wanted to do something for this day. So this is the first and last time we will have a standalone Baldwin King Memorial Lecture because next year, moving forward, we'll be doing it with Simmons College of Kentucky. <laughs> and so, you know, Kevin Cosby, helps to keep me sane, and I appreciate and love you, brother. Um, last person I really want to recognize before we finish up outside of our Envirome team, and Nestle is here, she gets tired of me talking about her and them. Um, this program is, is really made possible because of a partnership we have with the mayor's office and a position created by Mayor Greg Fisher. Folks are real quick when somebody ain't in a, a space to kind of be like, oh, he or she wasn't this, that, or the other. Or if one thing happens that they don't like, oh, he or she ain't this, that, or the other. I'm a loyalist, personally, and, and a criminal at heart, which Kim Clay can attest to. <laughs> if, if I love you, if I'm your friend, I don't care what you do. You could kill somebody. And, and, and I'm going to be like, you want me to help you cut them up? <laughs> but Greg Fisher hasn't killed anybody, have you? <laughs> but for me, he wasn't just a good mayor. He was a good friend. He tried to, no matter, it doesn't matter if you fail as long as you try. And he always tried to do the right thing, as far as I know. There are some other people that have problems with him. I mean, we would have little secret meetings. Remember, we were sitting in a park one day, and his bodyguard is walking around like, man, why are we sitting in this park? I feel like it's a mob meeting or something. <laughs> we were talking about how to handle things. He, they, they brag in New Orleans about taking down Confederate statues. No, we did that here first. Yeah. Me and him, together, did it first. Right? And he, he just didn't want to publicize it for whatever reason. Maybe he thought that the Confederates would be angry with him. I'm not sure. But Greg put a position together which is now inhabited by our dear sister Joy McAtee. When I started to do this program, Joy reached out and she said, look, brother, whatever you're doing, you know, I got so much love and trust for you that I got a little bit of money. I'm trying to give it to you to help. And I'm like, wow, because I ain't like Kevin. I ain't good at raising money. That man raised $100,000 this morning to trip me out. And, and I was like, <laughs> well, I don't know why y'all clapping. He ain't gave me none of it. But, but I ain't good at it. But, but Joy reached out and offered to help. And I love her for it. Where are you, Joy McAtee? You can't miss that hairstyle. Where's she at? Stand up, Joy. Thank you, sister. So for everybody from the University of Louisville, from Pan-African Studies and Byron, thank you all for your support. And let's get into it after the thanks. We can do thanks forever and then just drink and love on one another, because God knows we need to love on one another in the environment that we're living in. We were supposed to have 
if you didn't know another speaker, but that fell through at the last minute. It wasn't able to happen. And I said to myself, and this happened yesterday, and I said, man, I need another speaker. Who, who can talk about James Baldwin and, and Martin Luther King Jr.? And I'm like, Kevin Cosby's ass got to get out to the mic. <laughs> so I started to call Kevin, but I didn't. But I, I, I talked to my father. I said, man, I think, you know, I'll do this. And he said, why would you not do that anyway? You from Atlanta, like King. You went to Morehouse, like King. This is something that you were supposed to do. He said, God wanted you to give this talk. And I was like, OK, oh man, maybe you're right. So y'all got me instead of somebody else. But I also thought, I write a lot in Louisville. At heart, I'm a writer. And I speak, too. But it, it dawned upon me, while I write a lot in Louisville, I don't speak a lot in Louisville. I think some people don't want to invite me to speak here. I speak a lot in other places, but, but not necessarily in Louisville. So I, I want to take a little time. And this really worked out. It was Providence. It's like Joshua, who wanted to, you know, go somewhere that God didn't want him to go, and he ended up in a well. And so I'm listening to God on this. But it gives us a chance, I think. Jonah. Wasn't it Jonah? Not Joshua. It was Jonah. <laughs> Tim. Tim is over there. Okay, you got it right. The Jays, I get them confused. My favorite is David anyway. <laughs> and David is my favorite because he was so incredibly flawed, but God still loved him, and that's me. <laughs> but seriously, it, it gives us a chance, without an outsider, to, as a family, take a little time to talk about where we are and where we need to be, what's wrong and what's right, to examine ourselves for a minute in the context of this sacred day when we lost King. So Kevin, I was going to start with a Bible verse. But then I said I wasn't going to do that because you'll start bugging me about preaching again. <laughs> but on this day that we lost King, on King Memorial Day, I'm going to go to the Malcolms. I don't want to talk off the cuff, so I sat down and I actually wrote some things out to respect you, and then we can get into conversation afterwards. Anybody that I failed to mention, please forgive me, and we'll come back and point you out later, hopefully. But the title of this is we talk about what would James Baldwin and Martin Luther King think of America today is know who hates who. Know who hates who. Thirteen years after Martin Luther King Jr.'s death in 1981, South Carolina's most effective and brutal Republican operative, Lee Atwater, was working in Ronald Reagan's White House. During his tenure there, Atwater was interviewed by Case Western Reserve University political science, scientist Alexander Lamas, which was eventually published in Lamas's 1984 book, The Two-Party South, which I actually have read, Kevin. In the interview, Atwater, now famously, nobody paid attention at the time, but now famously, he summarized the core of what many of us have come to know as the Southern strategy, which Republicans used to solidify its hold on the region by using a racially hostile political agenda built on anti-blackness, but hiding it over time. Atwater said, and I quote, you start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger anymore. That hurts you. It backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff, and you're getting so abstract. Now you're talking about cutting taxes. All these things you're talking about are totally economic things on their face. And a byproduct of them is blacks get hurt more than whites. We want to cut this is much more abstract than even the busing thing, and a hell of a lot more abstract than nigger, nigger. But it still works. Many wrongfully believe the Southern strategy began with Atwater. They are wrong. 
The roots of the Republicans' modern anti-black movement can actually be traced back to a man many of you have probably never heard of, another Republican political analyst named Kevin Phillips. In a 2023 Washington Post article marking Phillips' death last year at the age of 82, columnist Greg Sargent wrote, quote, Phillips' 1969 book, The Emerging Republican Majority, actually provided the blueprint for what we now call the Southern strategy that the Republican Party adopted for decades to win over white voters who were alienated by the Democratic Party's embrace of civil rights in the 1960s. So they were alienated by the Democratic Party's embracing of a movement seeking racial equality in America. Be clear about that. Phillips advised Republicans to exploit the racial anxieties of white voters, linking them directly to issues such as crime, federal spending, and voting rights. Does any of this stuff sound familiar? He's talking about this in 1969. The strategy, beginning with Richard Milhouse Nixon's victory in 1972, helped produce GOP majorities for decades. Now listen to this. Updated versions of the Southern strategy live on in today's Republican Party, shaping the political worldview we now inhabit. The fulcrum of realignment is the law in order, is the law in order Negro socioeconomic revolution syndrome, Phillips said. And he wrote in an internal memo, Nixon should continue to emphasize crime decentralization of federal social programming and law and order. And he added that the party should run radio ads which featured movie star John Wayne, emphasizing that Nixon is just folks who will end urban riots. The idea in essence was to co-opt white Democrats by associating blacks with the Democratic Party. Quote, the more Negroes who register as Democrats in the South, the sooner the Negrophobe, the Negrophobe whites, will quit the Democrats and become Republicans, Phillips told the New York Times at the time. He said, that's where the votes are. Phillips maintained that he was not a racist. He was simply describing human behavior. Quote, the whole secret of politics, he said, is knowing who hates who. Put simply, Phillips believed Republicans could capitalize on the fact that a good percentage of whites in America hated black people so much that they would express their hatred with their votes. Sadly, time has proven him correct. Men like Martin Luther King Jr. and James Baldwin already knew Phillips was right. King died a year before P Phillips published The Emerging Republican Majority in 1969 and seven months before Richard Nixon was elected president of the United States for the first time in 1968. People forget Nixon was elected twice. He barely won the 1968 race by gathering 43.4% of the vote to Democrat Hubert Humphrey's 42.7%. Notably, please remember this, the notoriously racist George Wallace, who had stood in the University of Alabama schoolhouse door to prevent blacks from attending that school in 1963, was the nominee of the American Independent Party in 1968, and he won a full 14% of the vote. Two weeks after I was born, on July 28th, 1967, Lyndon Baines Johnson, I know y'all think that I'm still 35. I'm not. Lyndon Baines Johnson formed the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders colloquially called the Kerner Commission, after its chair, Illinois Governor Otto Kerner, Jr. The US government at the time was confused 
and wanted to know why American Negroes were increasingly angry, misbehaving, and rioting nationwide. The Kerner Commission report was released on February 29th of 1968. Rather than attributing the rioting to a small group of outsiders or troublemakers, as many prior riot investigations had done, or to radicals or a foreign conspiracy, as almost 75% of white America believed, the commission concluded that the rioting was a response to, and I quote, decades of pervasive discrimination and segregation. The commission opined, quoting again, White racism is essentially responsible for the explosive mixture which has been accumulating in our cities since the end of World War II. What white Americans have never fully understood, but what the black man can never forget, is that white, so white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it. White institutions maintain it, and white society condones it, end quote. I know I ain't, I'm very intentionally not going off and being real emotional tonight. I want to teach a little bit, if that's OK. right? I want to be calm so you catch everything that I'm saying. So let me say that again. White institutions created it. White institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. Martin Luther King Jr. called the Kerner Commission report, quote, a physician's warning of approaching death, like our dear brother Dr. Wayne Tucks. A physician's warning of an approaching death with a prescription for life. A little over a month later, King's head was blown off in Memphis. While the Kerner Commission called for more attention to racial equality and justice, Richard Nixon called for more guns, police, and law and order assaults on the black community. His reward was a surge in popularity in white America. While considered a villain by some today, and certainly a villain by blacks then, Tricky Dick didn't sneak out a victory in 72 as he had in 68. Remember, he had also run in 60, but was beaten by JFK. But in 72, he crushed Democrat George McGovern by winning over 60% of the vote. That was his, that was the reward for his racism. Today, in 2024, it is a distinct possibility that the latest heir to Nixon's throne, a man who also abides by Kevin Phillips' Southern strategy and understands who hates who, may win a second term as President of the United States as black people continue to endure attack after attack after attack. Let me stop for a minute. If you believe that this country is reasonable enough to not elect Donald Trump again, let me disabuse you of that notion. Now, for my Democrats in the room, including my dear fraternity brother in the back, George Brown, who is an elected Democrat here, I'm not a Democrat. Not a Republican. I hate them both. I think the Republicans are too callous and the Democrats are too cowardly. As one of my mentors told me at Morehouse, he said, look, let me tell you about black people in our votes. We know that the Republicans, that the Demo we know that the Democrats will kill us. But at least they'll wait till next week. The Republicans will kill us tonight. And so every time black folk vote for the Democrats, we're really voting for seven more days to plot. That's what it is. So we have to hold the Democrats responsible for what they do not do. They can't come visit every two, four, or six years 
and then expect us to sit quietly while our agendas are never spoken to. That's just real talk. So when people say, go vote, you need to tell them, go do some work. Let me get back to it. By 1968, James Baldwin had moved beyond his expatriate phase in France and had resettled in New York. But his pen was still scathing as he tried to navigate spaces between black Christians and Muslims, integrationists and nationalists, and figure out his place in the civil rights movement and black people's place in America and the world. By this time, Baldwin had already written what many consider his greatest works. Go Tell It on the Mountain, Giovanni's Room, Another Country, Native notes of a native son in the fire next time. Now he was searching indeed, but no matter what he produced literarily or didn't, Baldwin's bravery as a writer, and this is why he's my favorite, his bravery as a writer was unequaled. His commitment to the truth was unwavering, and he understood the toll of racism on black people. Baldwin didn't speak at the March on Washington in 63, and Malcolm X said they weren't going to let Jimmy Baldwin speak because they didn't know what he might say. That was James Baldwin. But Baldwin had pro proclaimed years earlier, and I quote, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of rage almost all the time and in one's work. And part of the rage is this. It isn't only what is happening to you as an individual, but it's what's happening all around you and all of the time in the face of the most extraordinary and criminal indifference of most white people in this country and their ignorance. They don't care because it doesn't affect them in the same way. It's what Baldwin was saying. By 68, King was flailing. Like W.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, and others, he had been abandoned by many leaders of the NAACP and other black legacy organizations. He was still hounded by the U.S. government as J. Edgar Hoover and COINTELPRO continued its efforts to destroy black leaders and resistance to, ra to racial inequality. He was not only questioning integration, he was beginning to embrace various tenets of black nationalism more and more, if you actually read King. He was struggling to hold together his own coalition of lieutenants like Ralph Abernathy, Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, Hosea Williams, and others, who all quickly went their separate ways after King's death. King hadn't had a major victory in years, and his popularity in the country had plummeted. These are hard things to hear, aren't they? As he neared death, almost 70 5% of Americans overall disapproved of him, labeling him a race-baiting troublemaker. Painfully for King, over 55% of black people didn't support him. Those closest to King wondered how he could go on as he tumbled into depression. The immediate past provided no encouragement for Baldwin or King in 68. Mega Evers had been shot dead in his Jackson, Mississippi driveway in front of his wife and children in 63. King's simultaneous rival and comrade, Malcolm X, was murdered just over a year and a half later in New York after Evers. The Black Power Movement had been born a few years earlier and its leaders were already targeted, persecuted, and at times marked for death and later killed when you talk about people like Fred Hampton and Mark Clark and other Black Panthers who were driven out of the country. Du Bois, one of Black America's greatest intellectuals, had given up on America seven years earlier. He wrote to his friend Grace Goins in September of 1961, and I quote, I just cannot take any more of this country's treatment. We're talking about W.E.B. Du Bois, the first black man to earn a PhD from Harvard University in 1895. The author of Dust of Dawn, Philadelphia Negro, right? Souls of black folk. An absolute monster. The only black officer in the NAACP when it was founded. W.E.B. Du Bois. Another HBCU man, people talk about Harvard. Du Bois said to hell with Harvard. What I know about struggle, I learned right down the road in Nashville at Fisk. This is Du Bois, the man who laughed in the face of criticism and hatred. He said, by the time I was 75, my death was practically requested, but I live on. 
And Du Bois got to the point in 61 where he said, I cannot take it anymore. He said to Grace Goins, chin up and fight on if you must, but realize that American Negroes can not win. Du Bois left for Ghana the next month and never came back. He died the day before the 1963 March on Washington, a mere two months after Evers. King's 13 years on the front lines of America's Civil Rights War ended when he was murdered in Memphis on April 4th of 68. He was only 39 years old. People don't get that. Both King and Malcolm, though born four years apart, Malcolm was born in 25, 1925. King in 29, they both died at 39. They never saw 40 years old. And you see pictures of King, you're like, wow, he was 35, 36, 39 right there. He looks so much older. Why? Because of the stress of American racism. When the autopsy was done on him, they said the man had, his brain had the folds of an 80-year-old. That's what stress will do to you. He's 39 years old. But King once said this, if the lions do not live to tell their story. The hunters will take all the credit. And that's what has happened. He did not survive, and we have largely allowed those who once hunted revolutionaries like King and Baldwin to now teach and tell their stories. As we now wrestle with the quandaries of integration and integrated education, remember what Malcolm X once warned. He said, only a fool will let his enemy teach his children. It follows that only a fool would allow his enemy to tell his story, for their version will inevitably be a lie. Lies paralyze. True education liberates, but also troubles. So when you talk about what true education can do, it lets you know why the white supremacists right here, right now in 2024 in this state are trying to stop true education from being offered to children in this state, whether they be black or white and want to build a world that is truly free and equal. These people ain't worried about BLM or CRT or DEI. They don't even know what the hell they are. They're anti-black racist. That's what they are. Your colleague Robert Stivers is a racist. Jennifer Decker is a racist. Max Wise is a racist. And if they don't want to deal with that, Races can be reformed, but only when they admit what they are. They are attacking our children. And if we are not brave enough to stand up and fight for our children, what will we fight for? Baldwin said of education, the paradox of education is precisely this. As one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. And that is why education is under attack. Those who understand who hates who want to exploit that hate even now and do not want our children educated and conscious enough to examine and expose them. King did not live to see the real king largely erased from America and American education. He did not live to see himself frozen at the Washington Monument and reduced to a few utopian out of context words taken from his I Have a Dream speech. Lost is the intellectual king who studied Marx, Niebuhr, Hobbes, Plato, Aristotle, Hegel, Thoreau, Nietzsche, and Gandhi and could engage their theories with the best minds of his time. Lost is the rational, critical king who saw undirected emotionalism in the church and the movement as counterproductive. Lost is the warrior king who got angry and screamed that he was, in fact, tired of marching and fighting for rights which should already be his. Lost is the political king. See, this is what we talk about teaching in Pan African studies, right? We talk about teaching in black studies all over the place. This is what these people are calling CRT. What CRT really is, critical race theory, if you really know what Derrick Bell was talking about, Right? If you really know what Kimberly Crenshaw was talking about, they ain't read Kimberly Crenshaw. They just say, look, racism should not be explored on an individual basis. It should be explored on an institutional basis. So if you talk about integrating a school, later for integrating a school, I don't just want black teachers. I want to have black teachers who don't think like Daniel Cameron. I don't want to just integrate a school. I want to know what's being taught to my children. I know y'all shudder when I call a name, right? <laughs> Sometimes we have to do that. We have to call names. We have to check out curriculum. 
right? I don't give a damn about no DEI office if your DEI officer is weak and milk toast. I'm not fighting for DEI. DEI is just the latest iteration in the movement that is trying to move us towards equality and freedom, right? But you ever wonder why? When these racists were fighting, were fighting and fighting and fighting to destroy DEI, really they're trying to destroy black access to education in this state, in this time, not in the 60s, this year. You didn't hear a damn word from most of the DEI officers? Now that's a problem. When these people are attacking higher education and black access to higher education, you didn't hear a word from most of the presidents of the universities in this state? And if you did hear a word from them, it was so watered down from their advisors and their legal counsels that it didn't mean a damn thing. So I don't care anything about that. I mean, I understand the DEI thing. I created that DEI office over at the University of Louisville, and now it's populated by a man that y'all don't even know because he don't come out in the community. Real talk. And I ain't telling you nothing that I won't tell him to his face. <laughs> we got one good one, Derek Cowherd over here. You still do D.I. over in athletics, Derek? Good. He one of my old students. He better do right. <laughs> I hit him in the head with a brick. <laughs> but what we're left with, we're, we're lost. Lost is King, the lover of the people who died working for the rights of sanitation workers, not sitting comfortably with the bourgeoisie. Loss is the revolutionary king who the U.S. government considered the most dangerous black man in America before Malcolm presented a more radical variation on the same theme. We're left now with a false image of king which cripples and confuses with sound bites and an emptied out commercialized holiday. People go ride around in a little motorcade or go to a march and they don't know nothing about it. They never read a word the king wrote. And that's a problem. So King didn't live to see the appropriation of his image and his mission by the religious and political right, inside and outside the race. He didn't live to see racist, anti-black politicians and pundits misuse his words, arguing people should, quote, not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character to oppose black progress. He didn't live to see the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for which he fought so fiercely, weaponized by the United States Supreme Court and attorneys general like Kentucky's Russell Coleman to justify the legal destruction of affirmative action, diversity initiatives, and set the fight for racial equality back decades. King didn't live to see the Voting Rights Act of 1965, of which he was so proud, gutted, and rendered little more than a scholar from Harvard called a dead letter by the Shelby County versus Holder ruling in 2013. And since then, racial voting disparities in America have increased exponentially as state after state after state passed voter suppression laws targeting black people. King was a brave man born out of the black radical tradition and he didn't live to see cowardly black free riders, not freedom riders. If you don't know the difference, look that up who will not open their mouths in defense of their people. He didn't live long enough to see the Ward Connollys, Clarence Thomases, Candace Owens, and Daniel Camerons of the world. He didn't live to see Tim Scott. Or is it Tom Scott? <laughs> Skinning and grinning and genuflecting before Donald Trump as he bastardized the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, saying that Americans are sick and tired of being sick and tired. If you don't know your history, you don't even know that that man was quoting Fannie Lou Hamer as he praised Donald Trump. Some of you might be sitting there saying, who is Fannie Lou Hamer? It tells you that America's done some work on you. He didn't live long enough to see a black man running for governor in North Carolina who proudly proclaims that black people owe America reparations. Nor did King live long enough to see a black president or the unrelenting white backlash that has followed him. The searing truth-telling James Baldwin didn't see most of it either. And he outlived King by 21 years, eventually dying in 1987 during the racial onslaught of the Reagan era. He was only 63 years old. For those decades, though, Baldwin was the one left behind. 
He lived long enough to bear witness to the grief, pain, and white retribution that followed the murder of many of his friends in the movement. And what Baldwin saw was neither pretty nor encouraging. He damningly reflected on it by saying, I'm terrified at the moral apathy, the death of the heart, which is happening in my country. These people have deluded themselves for so long that they really don't think I'm human. I base this on their conduct, not on what they say. And this means that they have become, in themselves, moral monsters. Current political and social anti-blackness has grown more and more brazen in America. And unfortunately, there are precious few kings or Baldwins left to fight. So what would King and Baldwin think of America today? They think we're in trouble. They think so because many blacks who are theoretically best prepared to fight now deliver no serious challenge to the hegemonic structure. That's a nice academic word. Hegemony means domination. They, they deliver no challenge to those structures which continue to oppress black people. Why? Because they're afraid to lose their positions in paper of the green sort. That's what's left in the wake of Baldwin and King. King, a man who only took a dollar a year from his organization, the SCLC. And he said this, quote, if you're really going to be free, you have to overcome the love of wealth and the fear of death. At some point, we need to get away from talking about King in out of context sound bites. But if you like quotes, let me end with a few. To the poli politics of respectability and elite Negroes that I sometimes rub shoulders with. You know what I'm talking about, Newt. Well, I'm too good for all of this stuff that you're talking about. You have to do things the right way. Or, this is my favorite. If I hear another politician or a university leader say, we're doing things behind the scenes. You're a damn coward is what you are. <laughs> I'm working behind the scenes. Well, your work ain't working, boo. I mean, come on now. That, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's cold word for coward. But these folk who want to blame black folk, we got more and more black folk who've been so brainwashed, they blaming black folks. You got to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Here's what King said about that. Now, there's another myth that still gets around. It's kind of an over-reliance on the bootstrap philosophy. There are those who still feel that if the Negro is to rise out of poverty, if the Negro is to rise out of the slum conditions, if he is to rise out of discrimination and segregation, he must do it all by himself. And so they say the Negro must lift himself up by his own bootstraps. They never stop to realize that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. The people who say this never stop to realize that the nation made a black man's color a stigma. It still is. But beyond this, they never stop to realize that the debt they owe of people who were kept in slavery for 244 years. It's all right to tell a man to lift himself up by his own bootstraps, but it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. That's key to those who cowardly keep their mouths shut when they should stand up and speak up when they know wrong is flourishing. Martin said, where your people are concerned, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. And Audre Lorde, our dear sister, said, your silence will not protect you. All of these universities who are trying to change the names of their doggone diversity officers, they probably don't change your name too, Derek, thinking that the race is going to run away and leave them alone. They changed the name. University of Texas at Austin. They changed all the names. Diversity ain't nowhere in the names. They just fire all of those officers. Change the name, racists still got them. So that ain't going to work. You better open your mouth. Education, Carter G. Woodson, let's go with Baldwin and King for a second. Carter G. Woodson said this of education. If you can control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. When you determine what a man shall think, you do not have to concern yourself about what he will do. If you make a man feel that he is inferior, you do not have to compel him to accept an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. 
If you make a man think that he is justly an outcast, you do not have to order him to the back door. He will go without being told. And if there is no back door, his very nature will demand one. Two more quotes, and we're going to finish up. This ain't all about conservatives either. Liberals, white liberals, yes, sir. King has something to say about you if you have read Letter from a Birmingham Jail. King said of white liberals in their paternalism and maternalism, always telling black folk, you got to do things the right way. In other words, you got to function within the boundaries that we have prescribed, like you are still our children. You are our charges. I am incredibly insulted by that. And then people say, well, you're so arrogant. Yeah, I think I'm smarter than most white people. Black people, too. <laughs> Why not? These people are electing damn fools as presidents. They elected a woman to the doggone uh, uh, state legislature who was talking about her daddy was a slave in the mid-20th century. What the hell is that? These are idiots. <laughs> And they're leaders. They are leading the state and the country. And people wonder why it's all messed up. And then we want to start talking about DEI stands, but didn't earn it. Didn't earn it. You stole this country. You betrayed those Native Americans who took you in when you were lost and didn't know where the hell you were. You killed those people. You stole human labor from Africa. You treated God's children like they were less than trash. You ain't got nothing here because you earned it, because God chose you, because you were smarter than anybody. You just brought levels of violence to the world that nobody else was able to even conceptualize. Yeah. So stop, right? King said of white liberals, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of supposed goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. That's king. So what do we need? What do we need? Yes, America continues to attack black people. And now they're telling us that we're making it all up. I think that's what the young folk call gaslighting, Doc. <laughs> black people need better modern leadership that remembers the words and strategies of the Kevin Phillips and the Lee Atwaters and the Newt Gingriches and the Lindsey Grahams and the Russell Colemans and the Jennifer Deckers and the Max Wises and the Robert Stivers. Y'all tell them I said it. Because they know who hates who. And they stoke it. But we need leaders who know who they are and will speak on it. Yesterday, Reverend Cosby dedicated a building over at Simmons College of Kentucky in the name of longtime warrior and educational champion Diane Porter. Greatly deserved. <laughs> Greatly deserved. And he said, the reason we can name this building after Diane Porter is because we own this. We own Simmons. It's a black institution. I wonder if U of L would name a building after me, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> 
But what was incredible, one of the speakers at that event stood up and said, she said, right now, speaking of the Kentucky legislature, she said, we have to celebrate the terrible legislation that they didn't pass. They did no good in Frankfurt. You know, it, it was just the stuff that they're, they're infighting amongst themselves. They couldn't pass. It ain't, it ain't like nobody really fought them back on the DEI thing. You know, those snakes were just going at each other so bad they couldn't come to an agreement to pass the doggone hate law that they were trying to get through. But they'll be back. They'll be back next year. I'm sure of it. But make no mistakes as we close. Phillips' strategy is still coursing through Kentucky's political veins and America's as well. And the sad thing is, again, that we don't have people who will stand up and speak to it. And we have to remember a few things. As war, starvation, and borderline genocide happens in the Middle East, it is ironic to recall the words of our Jewish brother, Martin Niemöller, on the evils of silence. It reflected on Hitler in the Third Reich. Niemöller famously said, first, they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. So I want to tell you all, there are four things that impact us. And my reverend has taught me to do these acronyms that I talked about a little bit today. Why don't people speak out? Fiji, y'all remember this. Not the J, but a G. F-I-G-I. Fear, ignorance, greed, and indifference. People won't speak out because of fear, ignorance, greed, and indifference. Another great woman said, when we talked about this last King quote, King said this, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience ask the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. As another great black American familiar with racial oppression said, some people been doing wrong for so long that they forgot how to do right if they ever knew what right was. That great American was my grandma. <laughs> so what would Baldwin and King think today? They probably think we're in a tough place and America still knows who to hate, who hates who and how to capitalize on it. Baldwin and King knew, but they never ran from fighting those who hated them and their people or remained silent. Neither of them were ruled by fear, ignorance, greed, or indifference, and we can't be ruled by them either. We aren't where we need to be, and we need to come together and discuss that much more openly and honestly and bravely. But when we do that, we know if we're honest with ourselves, we can be better. If we're honest with ourselves, we must be better to save ourselves and American democracy. And I understand there are a lot of passive people right now. But I'll close with our dear brother Langston Hughes, who said this, Negroes, or DEIs, or whatever you want to call them, Negroes, sweet and docile, meek, humble, and kind, beware the day they change their minds. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> that was very interesting. If you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. But would you, while people are thinking about it, we'll just take just a couple of questions. While people are thinking. I, you, look, wait. I want to stay as long as y'all do, because last time, if people need to leave, please do. But I don't want to cut our dialogue off. There were some folks that wrote me last time from Filson, and they were like, I really wanted to talk more. So Wayne might leave, because that's what he does. Mm -hmm. Hey, give it up for Dr. Wayne Tuxin. This, this is my man. But, but I'll stay. It, it, it's only 10 after 7. So it, he'll it's stay, not. but we want people to keep coming back for more of these talks, you see. So they don't want to get to all your talk. And you know, I don't, somehow or another, I don't think you're going to run out of wind. Um, but what would people thinking about questions? So would you address uh, one of the other issues with, which people seem to look, look at right now? Question is, are we a leader full or a leader less group now, especially as we start looking at the uh, with Black Lives Matter movement? We're seeing a decline of other traditionally organized things. And I think this really came to a head uh, at the recent March on Justice with Al Sharpton when he had his group and they were speaking and there was what appeared to be a denial of the folks from Black Lives Matter the opportunity to speak. And it seems as though there is a reluctance on the part of some senior folks, remnants left over from the civil rights movement of the 60s, 70s, to turn over the baton or at least change the attitude how we need to change strategy or styles in doing so. How would you comment on that? That's a lot. Um, I think you can't get wrapped up. One organization doesn't speak for everybody, right? And sometimes even within particular organizations, you can look at different chapters and those chapters are going to move differently. Like the Black Panther Party, what was going on with the Illinois Panthers was very different than what was going on with Panthers in other parts of the country. Same thing like we talked about with the Urban League, you know, different. We had different stuff. Uh, when you talk about Black Lives Matter, there are people who want to point to Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter got a lot right and they got some stuff wrong. Okay, but I'm not one to throw the baby out with the bathwater necessarily. We have leaders. A brother named Robert Jones wrote a book saying we have no leaders, but really what Jones was talking about, we have bad leaders at this point. But what's, m my focus is more on the pressures that the system itself puts on black people, right? And, and th this is where I'm different than, than some DEI folks because what, one of my problems with that movement is it takes everybody who is not white and lumps them into one little category, right? And so then you lose focus on different groups. Like, look, man, I fought so hard for some of my LGBTQ brothers and sisters in the past that folks at the University of Louisville thought I was gay. They're like, well, you must be gay. Why are you fighting for the gay people? Are you gay? I was like, I might be, but I still don't want you. But <laughs> their struggle is different. Like, the struggle of continental Africans is different than the struggle of African Americans. But you don't resist if you're convinced there is nothing to resist. That's really a part of the bootstrap thing that we're talking about. And folks are pushing that harder and harder, right? That there's really nothing to, res to resist, that America really is the playing field is level, that equality has been achieved. And they'll pick out individuals and say, look, just because this individual made it, everybody can make it. Make it. And, and, and that's simply not true, you know? So, if, if we fall prey to that, we talk about leadership or engagement, then we have problems, right? And so some of us that have quote unquote made it, I mean, like, you know, our daughter, both her parents have PhDs. So she goes to a private school. Yeah, we're springing for that 27 grand every year, right? I mean, everybody can't do that. And so it's crazy for us to sit back and be like, oh, I got a PhD at 28. Her mama got a PhD at what? 29. So, why can't all black people get PhDs? That's crazy. I mean, that's, that's stupid, right? And so what are the pressures put on people? And beyond that, who are we accepting as leaders and who is choosing those leaders? Booker T. Washington was the first example of a black leader chosen by white America. Now most black leaders are chosen by white America. You look at most college campuses, for instance, let's use this as we're talking about education. And look at the black people who are put in positions, Yvonne knows this, who are put in positions at these schools in administration. They're usually the weaker, most non-threatening black people they can find. They're not gonna rock the boat, right? 
I mean, and they'll do like crazy stuff. Like people say to me, well, you're doing well. They haven't fired you. Our tenure must have been great. Look, I was telling these people what they were doing before I got tenured. Y'all please understand that. Yvonne will tell you that. Am I lying, Yvonne? Straight up. But I always knew there was a price to be paid. When have you heard of me holding a position outside of Pan-African Studies? It's not going to happen. I always chuckle when the University of Louisville, they just came out the other day giving out a list of awards. Did you see that, Yvonne? The Diversity Champion Award. Yvonne knows this, y'all don't. A few years ago, a committee voted to give me a diversity award at the University of Louisville, Joy. The dean took it and gave it to a fool. <laughs> and, and don't worry, I told her she's a fool to her face. Gave it to a fool, right? I never would have known that I had been given the award except a member of the committee said, hey, you know that award that was given to that fool? And she didn't call her a fool. I was like, yeah. And this was a white sister. And she was like, we voted to give that to you. And I laughed. And she said, you don't seem upset. I was like, listen, I'll start to worry when the University of Louisville actually gives me an award. <laughs> right? And so look at the leaders who are being chosen. And, and I think that, that says something about leadership. That's why black institutions are so incredibly important. They can choose their own leaders. If, 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 if Kevin put a fool out there, I'm going to him like, man, what you doing? You, you know? But y'all better, better be clear. I mean, look down the road at Tennessee State. Yeah. They just wiped out their whole board of trustees at Tennessee State, right? And politicians in Tennessee just replaced them. Your school, George. And you don't even hear much about it. We're more worried about crazy stuff. Like, they let, I'll get back. Well, I, first of all, I appreciate you not mentioning <clears throat> that Howard put Lee Atwell on the uh, board. Howard did what? Yeah, you heard me, right? <clears throat> Put him on the board. He, he went to Howard, y'all. He's a Howard man. So anything that can bring Howard and Morehouse together is, right. is great. And he has admitted that Morehouse is, in fact, the better of the two schools. So we appreciate that. If you walk up those stairs, you'll notice the ranking between Howard and Morehouse. <laughs> we step on that. Um, let me ask uh, former Mayor Fisher. Um, uh -oh. no, we put him on the spot. Yeah, I mean, why not? Uh, he's not running. You're not running for anything else right now, are you? OK, good. <laughs> And I don't mean this to be put you on the spot, but there is no elected official in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and or Louisville who's ever won the election without carrying the African-American vote. You've heard Dr. Jones comment that our allegiances, African-Americans and others, to the Democratic Party. What should be expected, given the power of the vote of African-Americans, should we expect from elected officials? And then I want Dr. Jones to comment on your response. Well, you should expect results, right? So what is it that somebody campaigns on and then do they do it? You know, are they saying that uh, we're going to work to make sure every public high school graduate has a free college education? Do they do it? Are they going to have an economic development plan for West Louisville? Is it educated or is it ex executed? Uh, what kind of health gap? goals are going to be put into place and how do you execute your public health strategy. So yeah, you should hold people accountable for what they say they're going to do and realize that it's a journey that no one person can execute by themselves. Look at their team. Is their team in place and are they pushing toward equity? Are they not afraid to say unpopular things? Will they take position on racial issues and realize that's going to upset some folks? But the reality is uh, that people are more supportive of what Dr. Jones is saying than what most people think. One of the activities I'm involved with right now is called Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. And most Americans, when they hear that, they think, well, people are against people having a guaranteed income. That's not true. 62% of Americans believe that people that, below, that earn below the median income are entitled to a family supporting wage. That's not a commonly held belief. 80% 80, 80 of Democrats, 62% of independents, 42% of Republicans. It's just that people are afraid to say what they think is unpopular. So your elected officials have to be unafraid, but people have to be unafraid. I thought the summer of 2020, could be an inflection point for this country. Was it a moment or was it a movement? I grow increasingly concerned that it was just a moment. We talked about that. Because of this 
radical white nationalist extremist backlash that is very well thought through without strong opposition on the other hand to push back and put light on it. If there's anything I learned, and I'll close on this, in 12 years in office is that the forces of darkness and evil are strong and they keep coming. So if you don't fight it with light and good, you're going to get smoked. I hope you got a photograph of a politician giving a microphone up willingly. Just <laughs> so you made your point of saying you're neither Republican nor Democrat. But if you look back upon prominent African American leaders, we have clearly, or they have clearly rather, and Representative us, been firmly, at least post Roosevelt and perhaps definitely post Kennedy, firmly entrenched in the camp of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, when you think back with King standing behind Johnson in 64, um, did we get enough out of the bargain? First of all, please understand that party alliances shifted for black people over time. In the 19th century, black people were firmly Republican. When the Republican Party was founded in 1854, it was full of abolitionists, free soilers, and people who were absolutely committed, committed to racial justice, the large percentage of that party. Now, of course, you got the lily white Republicans who developed late, later, but there's a reason why Frederick Douglass, the greatest black leader of the 19th century, said that he was a Republican, and he would always be a Republican. But as you get into the 20th century, especially up, up around FDR, party alliances start to shift a bit, and then it's solidified in 1960 with the election of JFK and black people start to migrate over to the Democratic Party. So when Republicans tell you today we're the party to free the slaves, that is actually historically accurate. But what they fail to tell you is that they ideologically switched off. Now, when you talk about black allegiance to Democrats now, it's the same as black allegiance to Republic, uh, Republicans before. What happened in the American political system was it effectively cut out third parties. Third parties almost never win in, in American elections anymore. So it sets up not just black people, but all folk, you know, ideologically, they have a choice between one or the other. It's a bifurcated dichotomous choice, right? And so quite often, you don't have people, again, across lines of race, who vote for a candidate. They'll vote against another. Let's be real. How many of you are really excited about Joe Biden? No, I mean, seriously, there, there aren't very many people who are excited about Joe Biden, right? But they think Donald Trump presents an existential threat. So they're not really voting for Biden, they're voting against Trump. Now, every now and then we'll get a candidate that people are excited to vote for. Barack Obama was one of those candidates, right? I mean, my uncle, who was racked by crack at the time, in 2008, had never voted in his life. He was like, I'm going to vote for Obama, man. Take me out here to get, get registered. And I was like, you voting? And he was like, yeah, yeah. Didn't even know who Obama was running against. He was like, I'm voting for Obama. But he was excited about Obama. I would hope that there were some people who were excited about voting for you, good mayor. I don't remember who you were running against, right? But this is what, why you get this happening. Black people just don't have anywhere else to go right now. And so when you, when you talk about any type of radical movement, not always black, right? When you look at radical movement without, within the Democratic Party to want to move it ideologically, that's quite often rebuffed. So that's another study without us getting too deep and, and, and too academic about it. 1852, Frederick Douglass gave his presentation on what the 4th of July means to the Negro. <laughs> and in that, he really opined that the enslaved African was perhaps more a believer in the concept of freedom and the ideals of the American mm -hmm. Constitution than did the whites. So the question I have for you, as we look at African Americans now, if you look at various studies, we are some of the most optimistic people in the country, believe it or not. Uh, perhaps it's because we've had so very little we feel that it got to be better. But nonetheless, we remain optimistic. Do you think it requires a certain amount of optimism to keep getting out and protesting and marching to 
say we want human rights and demand human rights for people? Let me deal with your first one, your first uh, issue first, when you talk about black people and how aware that we are to um, um, the idea of equality and freedom. Black people in America believe in America's ideals and have worked harder to bring America's ideals into reality more than any other group. Think about the contradiction of America from its founding. Think about men sitting down talking about all men are created, freedom, liberty, and justice for all, while simultaneously a good percentage of them were holding slaves. That's a contradiction that, that people have yet to unravel, right? This country's still wrestling with that contradiction. Black people were always the ones who believed in freedom because it was taken from us. Black people are the ones who always believed in justice because we wanted to be treated justly. We've always been the ones who believed more than anybody else in equality because that's what we have always struggled for, right? And so even, and we're always the ones who will extend those beliefs and those morals to others even if they have denied them to us. Black jurors are always the ones who are going to give the benefit of the doubt first. We're the most forgiving people ever to walk the, the planet. I shudder to think what America would be had it not been for black people constantly trying to push its moral compass in the right direction. Why do we continue to protest and work? What else are we to do, right? I mean, why do you think black people are, are, are more religious than, than other folk? Because for the longest, they were so oppressed, they felt like there's got to be something better than this. This is why the black preacher's role in the, black, in the community was so outsized and so incredibly important. And that's why we had, to be, we had to be willing then and now to call out hucksters and hustlers who, who, who are posing as black preachers trying to exploit their own people. Because we depend on them so much. But my Lord, ain't nothing better than a good, dedicated black preacher who's going to go out there and go to war for you. Right? So we maintain that hope because that's how God built us for ourselves and for everybody else. Because with that hope, we not only give it to ourselves, we give it to others. And most of all, most of all, we tell our children there's something for you to live for. There's something better for you, right? There's something for you to achieve that we didn't. And see us fighting. Kevin Cosby's daughter sitting with him, and I know how he feels, because I feel about my own like this. These people who run around here act like cowards and won't open their mouth about anything, I'd be damned if my daughter gonna ever see me behave like a coward. That ain't gonna happen. She was just telling me about a dream she had where everybody gets killed, it was a repeated dream. And she said, everybody in the dream runs, but not me. I run and try to fight the people breaking in the house. And then they kill me, but I try to fight them. <laughs> right? And so that, that's, that's, that's what we got to give. On behalf of the Christine Lee Brown uh, <laughs> Environment Institute and Roots 101, thank you everyone for being here today. And please pray that uh, Jordan Jones goes to Howard. Thank you all very much for being here. He's going to end it with that. <laughs> And if any of you, if any of y'all want to talk to me, I'll hang around. All right. Hey, and look, thank you all for coming out so much. This is our last event of the season. We'll be back with you in the fall. We, I was worried about whether or not there'd be an appetite for it. It seems that there is. So let's keep doing it. Thank you, Baba. We appreciate you, man.